helped me uh, in so many difficult situations in my own life. I think to know that one really can do anything one wants to do, whether it is a passion, an artist, or a poet, or a dancer, or a doctor, whatever it is, to have the passion to do that and to be able to have the good health to do it is a grace. It's the gift of grace. Probably working in the medical profession, having finished with geriatrics and so on, I wanted to do my doctoral dissertation in arthritis of the hands. Because once again, to me, if hands, which are used for expression and life chores and everything, have a problem, it is a loss of dignity not to be able to use the hands and the arms and the active expression, the organs of action, the arms and legs. So I did my doctoral dissertation on arthritis of the hands and finger joints, and I decided I had to learn everything I could about hands and thumbs and fingers, and it was exciting to me because my hands were always with me. Feet are the foundation of the body. So if feet problems prevent one from walking or doing something, then feet are extension of legs which are connected to hands. And when I teach in the yoga class at Temple and the medical school, the first thing I encourage the students to do is know that they have the ability to have a positive or negative attitude. So attitude is important. In teaching a class, you want to learn. It has to be exciting. You have to be hungry to learn. Everybody, make me use your instrument. I want you to clap your hands. Lift your elbows up. Get tall. Spread your knees apart. Now straighten your leg. Come on. Ah. Now dance. Dance on your tiptoes. Yay. Dance. You've got to grab something. Grab your ankles. Yes. Come on. Now observe. Which leg do you want to open first? <laughs> hmm. 
Well, I decided to take the class because um, I've always had a hard time dealing with stress and a lot of pain in my back. I have um, a pinched nerve in my neck that causes a lot of pain and numbness in my, my hands and my face. Um, and after just the one semester, I, after a couple weeks, I noticed that the pain and numbness was uh, diminished. And when I had it, um, I had it less often. When I had it, it didn't, wasn't as bad. And um, I was able to deal with my stress related to school a lot better. Ah, uh, come on. Yeah, don't look at me. You have to smile so that this is the same. Is it? No. Then make it the same. You're going to say something to me, Ben Selva. You're going to say, well, I might have to do... I might have to have my mind still on my feet, yes or no? Mm -hmm. So if your mind is on your feet, then how long do you think you're going to stay here like this until you're going to shrug your shoulders, come up, shrug your shoulders and stand and say, well, through Dr. G's um, strategies of teaching Iyengar yoga, I finally understood how to get into positions in, in a good way rather than just stretching my body and putting all my weight on, you know, my knees or, and I was able to get into a better meditative state because my mind wasn't thinking about how, oh, my knees hurt or, oh, my elbows hurt or what am I, I can't do this, I can't do this because Dr. G would show us how to evenly distribute your weight and before I knew it, in a lot of positions, I was reaching further. I remember I was working with him in the medical class once with this lovely Indian famous movie star, Lalita Pavar. And she spoke no English and I spoke no Hindi. And then he said, here, you'll get along very well with this social lady from Philadelphia. He said it in Hindi. And she was a very famous Indian actress who played character roles. And she had a she wanted to do Padmas and she wanted to do Lotus Pose before she died. She had very bad arthritic knees. So Miss Reinger said, Well, he said, You want to learn about knees, you work with her. And I thought, hmm. And I worked with her and I saw some of the things he did, and she would scream and he would say something to her in Hindi. Then one day he said, you want to work here? Show. And he put her down on the floor, and I have a picture of this. And he said, put your finger there. And I did. He said, screaming, that that's not the way to do it. If you don't know what you're doing, why are you trying to help this woman or hurt her? We do not treat people like animals here. And I looked at him and I said, why don't you show me how to do it? And he did. But to do that, to say, look, I want to do it right. He took the time to show me as long as it wasn't hold this and don't move. It was something that he could explain like that. If you got it, fine. You didn't get it. You have an opportunity to see someone. But at that demonstration was Robert Angman. And he was so excited about it that the piece of sculpture that we looked at today was after BKS Iyengar. Art historians at colleges spend a lot of time gesticulating in front of slides of, of people's paintings, but it doesn't tell them at all what painting is. So, and, and not only that, but when you go to a museum and you see an array of finished, so-called important works of art, that doesn't have much to do with what they're really about either. <laughs> but if you start to paint yourself, now you find out where, how, how closely you locate to what painters ultimately come to when they start to invent things of their own. There's a, there's a whole world of common human experiences, things that we share together, and we can talk about it and have ideas, 
But there's one thing that takes place in each of us that cannot be shared with anyone else, and that's the connection all of these things have through us. That what what I, I've made, I don't know how many pieces of sculpture I've made, but I'm the only one that knows what that is. And as as much as I thought that that I, I could expose other people to the, to what that is, I, you can't do it. You can show them the things, but it doesn't tell them what, what that is. Not enough to help from the heart. You have to know the application of the pose. And this is, to me, what's the beauty of real yoga, the art of healing, that you can heal, but you have to feel. Meaning, if you're toe hurts not to look at the rest of the foot or the toes or the other foot is to eliminate the other side is to make it unknown so to bring the unknown the other side to the known which hurts maybe the knee hurts why doesn't anyone ever look at the other knee or the other elbow or the other hip because it's balance. And we can talk about symmetry and balance because we are human beings and we have our own rhythm and our own music. We find that. When that rhythm is interrupted by sickness or something, I've had that with a hip problem and I asked Mr. Anger if he could help me. Yes, of course, come to Pune. And he did. And I was very fortunate to have his application of yoga through him. I never asked him, what are you doing? Resist me and your ribs will be broken. If you resist me, I can't do my work. And Mr. Iyengar has never done anything unethical or inappropriate in his medical application of the subject which is what makes the man such a genius. But when the face is distorted by pain or the skin shows blemishes or the eyes, something happens to the eyes or what they can't see or the ears when there's a loss of balance or something to upset the alignment of the body, then we have to go within and see what we can do to help. And this is what's so amazing about anger and yoga because he is yoga, that if you know, if you really believe in the power to heal, the body will heal itself. But you need help. You need mental help, physical help, spiritual help, correct application of poses, and perhaps not doing a whole sequence, but one pose rarely is the answer. One pose has a is a composite of many poses. Believe it or not, one of my favorite poses is Tadasana, which is standing correctly. Observe. Standing on two legs, majestically, distributing the weight evenly on two feet, and lengthening the spine by taking the tailbone in, and lifting the diaphragm to open up the spine, to broaden the shoulders, to broaden the shoulder blades, and lengthen the arms, to stand majestically on two legs. Tadasana. We stand in Tadasana, and we begin with the arms. There's one on either side of us. I'm going to lengthen my spine and stand on my legs. Then I'm going to inhale on an exhalation. I'm going to lift my arms up, and as I lift them up, I want to be very mindful that there's no strain on either side of the neck. When you want to straighten your legs, you have to make the legs straight, but for some of you, you have to put your feet together. For others, you have to step your feet apart. Please try it. You see the effect without looking down at your feet. Observe. Without looking down at your feet, you have to see, do I want to put my feet together or do I want to keep my feet apart? That depends on you. What you want to do with that then is to see, what are my knees doing? 
Can I soften the heels? Can I come up on the metatarsals? No, that's not good. So observe. My feet hurt me. So I don't want to stand on my feet. I want to take my legs hip width apart. Take your legs hip width apart. How big are your hips? One here and one here. Now press down on your hands and observe. Are they the same? What is the energy in the left hand and the right? Without looking, without thinking, you have to see what is happening to the tail. Can you take the tailbone in and lengthen, soften the navel? Inhale on an exhalation. Extend your arms up. You have to lock your elbows. Don't look up. Let me see how far you can extend the elbows. What are the knees doing? No strain on the knees, yes or no? I want the arms straight. I want, the, I want you to lengthen this way, yes? You have to lengthen the front spine like this, so that does that, yes? This is a straight line. It could be that, how's it feel? Breathe, lady, breathe. Soften the breath. Don't use your energy. Use the intelligence. Say, I think I want to stretch still more. I want to lock my elbows. I want to extend my elbows to my wrists. I want to open my hands, but I want to spread the fingers. Come on, how long can you do this? You have to do it with straight legs, and you have to elongate by taking the navel in and soften the tootsies. Where are the tootsies? They're your fingers. Soften your tootsies and extend the arms. Not about hands, is it? You have to do that. Find something to sit down on. Something to sit down on has to be something that you're sitting down on, not up. So I'm going to walk back because I find that there is a stool back here. And if there's a stool and I put my hands here and I'm shrugging my shoulders, I have to make sure that I'm sitting on both of my buttocks. That my buttocks are telling me something that I need for balance. If I'm not sitting on both buttocks, then I don't know what I'm sitting on. It is really important to sit on both buttocks so that you can have alignment of the hips. Once you have that alignment of your hips and you know that the buttocks are there, then perhaps then you have to say, well, I have one here and one here, and then I can move my feet I can rest my palms on my hands, on my thighs. I have to keep my eyes open, and I have to know what my hands are doing. Therefore, it is very important that you know what you're sitting on, and you know what your hands are doing. So you have to stop and think think, what are my hands doing? And where are they? You're not allowed to look at your hands. You have to think, what are you sitting on? Well, I, I know that I'm sitting on a something straight. I know that I can put my hands on here and feel something can you feel the same thing on the right hand and the left and say, yes, I can. Bring your palms back together and say, yes, I can do that. Observe. My palms are touching. You're not allowed to touch your face, even though you want to. You have to know what your hands are doing and whether they're soft. If the palms are soft and you realize that the palms of your left hand and your right are soft, then you know that you've got fingers that operate the hands, that operate the palm, the skin. 
So you have to hopefully know that every finger has a hand and every hand has a finger. And if you lose the intelligence of the fingers of the right or the left hand, you think, well, I don't know what I'm doing because I have a pain in my elbow or my wrist or something. And if you know that you have a joint problem in your elbow, which is a joint, or the wrist, which is another joint, you might have a problem with a joint of the hand. It could be the right or the left. It could be a problem. And when there is a problem with one hand, the other hand has to be very sympathetic and say, well, I know that I have a problem with my left wrist or hand. I could have carpal tunnel syndrome. What's the other hand doing? It's called observation. It's called knowing the difference between what's going on in the left hand, the right hand, the left wrist, the right wrist, and what are you going to do if your hands aren't working and you have a carpal tunnel syndrome problem or you have a thumb problem and you can't text? You say, well, I might learn something if I put my cell phone down and turn it off, which would be a very good idea if you haven't done that. You put your cell phone down and understand that your cell phone is a cell. And you and I have cells all over our skin. A cell is a circle. Where are the circles? I'm sitting on two circles. I'm sitting on my right circle, my left circle, and the circles of my hands have to be the center of the palm of each hand. Now, where is the center of the palm of the hand? Well, I never thought about that. But I know that I have a really tremendous problem with my left wrist. I've been told I have carpal tunnel syndrome. I've been told that I might have to have a finger amputated, or maybe I did something with the thumb or something of one of my hands. It's really important to know what the other hand is doing, and maybe you should get a second opinion. And please understand that there is no substitute teacher training or any kind of training for medical doctors. A doctor is a highly professional person. I am not a medical doctor. However, I have been a doctor of yoga, meaning that I did my entire dissertation on hands. Because hands have always fascinated me. And when one hand bothered me, and maybe I had it looked at and was told, well, you have a bad hand, the other hand was always saying, I guess I'm really going to have to work harder. Hands come in pairs. They work. You have to know what's going on with both hands, with the wrists, with the elbows, with the shoulders, the entire arm. The arm is connected behind you. You have to observe what's going on behind you. Behind me, there is a wall. I know that nobody is behind me. That's why I can sit straight and smile. There's no one behind me. There's no one on my right. There's no one on my left. But I can sit up straight. I can sit on both buttocks. And I can sit in a position called Dandasana. If I am doing a correct Dandasana, 
according to the Sanskrit name Dandasana, which is a stick pose. Asana means posture. I better know that I have to sit on both buttocks. When I can do that, and you can do that, whether I'm sitting on a bench or a table or something that is straight, I can get the alignment, whether I'm sitting here on this bench, which is straight, with no sides, and nothing behind me, I have to know that I could go from here to the floor and sit in the floor pose, which is Dandasana, where one learns to do yoga correctly if one is going to sit on the floor. Now that you have to think about, and if you prefer to sit on the floor, make sure there's nothing behind you. You could go and sit on the floor against the wall. For now, we're sitting here on a bench. We're doing the posture Dandasana, and I want to know what my hands are doing. They have to go from here to here. This posture is called Namaste. It's called, it's really Namaskarasana, but if I'm Saluting the God within you, I have to move my hands back. Because what is inside of me is in front, it's behind. And if I don't know what's behind me, then I have to know that maybe I could do namaste and then lift my arms, but observe, I might have to drop my face, lift the arms up, and observe, are my arms straight? Well, maybe I should look up and say, oh my, maybe I need to bring my palms to look at each other, look up, look up, look up, and if you find looking up is difficult, then bring your arms down and look at your hands say, well, how can I look at my hands? I have to feel my hands, that they have no strain. And observe, hands should never have strain. Therefore, when one is learning the art of yoga, which is a healing art, correctly, you never want to put weight on the hands. Once you do, The hands become heavy, and you lose that wonderful, smooth, delicious feeling of soft palms. When the palm is soft, everything on the palm is your skin, because it's the same skin that's on your face and your back. You say, well, I, I never thought about the skin on my back. Well, maybe it's a good idea to think about what your back is doing when someone's in front of you. And you think, well, maybe now I want to try my Urdhva Hastasana again, and I know that there's nothing back there except a wall. Then I can drop my shoulders, tuck in my chin, mm, and say, well, I can interlace my fingers, keep the palms soft, exhale, and smile, and feel really good across the back. Keep my eyes open just in case I forget to smile. Relax my arms, my skin, and say, yeah. I can do that. Think. If you can do that, then you can do anything with your arms. However, you have to observe that arms have to be connected someplace behind you. Because what is behind you has to have a front. 
And when you understand the front of the body and the back, the back of the body is where we can't go with our eyes. We have to feel the skin. And we have to know that, isn't it nice? I can shrug my shoulders. I can open my eyes. But I have to understand that I can interlace my fingers, always being mindful to take the index finger of my left hand, your left hand, and observe, can you change the interlace or just have the right index finger soft, bend your elbow, shrug your shoulders, tuck in your chin, and make a big circle, you have to smile. Say, yeah, I can do it. That is called Namaskar, Urvahastasana, Parvatasana, in Dandasana. Meaning, I'm sitting on two buttocks, I can lengthen both of my arms, I can observe that it feels pretty good. I make a big circle, bring my hands back to Namaste, and observe, they might be a little softer than they were before. Well, once you've done that, you can congratulate yourself and say, well, I did that. <coughs> I have to cough. <coughs> You're allowed to cough. Because you think, well, <coughs> I'm coughing. <coughs> You're allowed to cough. But you're not allowed to laugh. Because if you laugh, you can't cough. And if you laugh and say, oh my goodness, look at me. I think I'd better get up. I have to feel here and here. And I have to get up. And I have to move and shrug my shoulders and say, I'm going to lift up my buttocks like that. And I'm going to bend and think, I think I want you to do one half Uttanasana. Meaning, I have to be able to know how to get up from what I'm sitting on. I want to be able to go back and say, I'm sitting. I don't want to press down here. And I may have mentioned it's a really good idea if you take off your shoes and socks. But you don't have to. But if you have something here and something here, and you don't know that they have to move in and up like that, then you can bend from the hip sockets, you can bend your legs, you can shrug your shoulders, and you can say, I'm going to do one half Uttanasana. I'm going to put my hands here. I have to think and say, maybe I need to bend. Maybe I need to bend. I think I'm bending well. I have to come up. And believe it or not, I don't have any pain in my hands. Amazing. It's amazing that when you and I can use this entire wonderful instrument that we live in, it's our body. It's the body that you came into this world with and hopefully you'll go out in the same body or maybe you won't. But while you're here, you have to know that if you have a body, you have to be able to feel good things in your body. Pain is a great teacher. If you can practice yoga correctly, you will know maybe how to have less pain than you've had before. It's a great teacher. Pain, do we want it? We've got it. It has us, we have it. But to be able to conquer the pain and say, I'm not afraid, I'm not afraid of that. When you have the fear, the fear will give you a fear complex. 
And when you have a fear complex, you can learn yoga sitting down. Because why? I know what I'm sitting on. And I'm not afraid to sit up straight. And I have to sit on the edge of the chair. Because if I sit back and do that, it's not as good as sitting up straight. Which is why sitting today is difficult for most people because they don't know how to sit correctly. But once you learn what each buttock is doing, you got one on the right and the left and one on the left and the right, it's a circle. And the circle is the center. You never work from the center. You have to work from the sides. If I work from the center of the palm of my hand, and I can't do that, I have to do this. When one practices yoga majestically and correctly, if we're lucky, we can get the pose straight away. If we're not lucky, then you practice. And by correct practice, it doesn't matter how long the practice is, be five minutes or two minutes, you have to have a mindful practice. That means you have to know what you're doing. And once you get that balance, that balance in your body, it gives you hope that you can do something. It gives you courage. It gives you really good posture. And you know how to balance ethics, the good, the bad the evil and the good. We all have the potential to be good. Wonderful song. Wonderful song, Be Good, Be Good, about Gregory Porter. Be good, be good, about the man who's in his cage. He's a lion. He's a lion. And someone comes around his cage and is walking around. It could be another lion. It could be a lamb. But he's distracted. Is he going to stay in the cage? Or is he going to break out of his cage and go find that distraction? Your cage is your rib cage. You know what's going on in the rib cage? It is a cage of bones. When you keep the bones soft in the rib cage, it opens the back ribs like wings. And when you open the wings of the back, you say, I can do this, but I have to really have a mindful, correct practice. And if I do, Maybe, maybe I'll learn something today that I didn't learn before. When we learn something sometime, we never know when that grace, that learning is going to happen. It just happens. And how do you explain it? Who can explain the light or the night or the morning or the time or the moment? It's the moment. It's here. It's now. And the now has to be the how of what you're doing. Do it right. Then you don't know whether it's morning or night. It's the moment. It's now. And when you turn now upside down, it means one. W-O-N. When you are a winner, you can go on with your life do whatever you're doing, whether you're playing music or sweeping the floor or whatever you do that you love to do, when you practice yoga correctly, it is an art that helps you do what you do better. When you do it and you love it, you say, well, now i got to go because <laughs> i got to go. You never leave anything without thanking the body. And how you're going to thank the body is saying, well, I need to rest. I need to do 
a little thanks. I need to give the horse a rest, the car a rest. I need to give my mind, my brain a rest. It doesn't really work to rest on a chair. You have to get down on the floor. To say, well, I, I can do that. But you have to know that if you look at how you're going to go from here to there, I have to be able to do a pose called Virabhadrasana 1, the warrior pose. Well, I don't know if I can do that. I have to take my arms to my shoulders, my shoulders, my arms. I have to be able to do this to say, there's the floor. I'm going to make a great big circle. I'm going to say, well, you know you can get down on the floor. Sit down on the floor. Find a spot on the floor. Lie down. Turn around. Lie down on the floor and say, I'm in Dandasana, but I don't want Dandasana. I got this, I got this, I got this, I got that, but maybe I just want to do this. Oh my, be careful that you're not near the chair or where you were. You got to know that there's a circle. You have to say, well, huh, I'm in the center. I'm now going to bend and I'm going to go back, but up, but up, oh, wrap, oh, oh, where's that? Mm. When you lie down and you see that with your eyes closed, that light, you don't know whether it's night or light. You just think, wow, this is really nice. I could stay here all day. You can do your Shavasana like this with your legs bent, or let go and say, I've got, um, I think I'll just extend one leg, extend the other, draw my legs apart, but you have to be mindful of the left leg. It has to lengthen to levelize your hips. Exhale, let go completely. Bring your elbows in. This is if you're on a bare floor. You can put your hands on your belly and say, I know you're there, ah, uh -huh, soft. And you're there, oh my goodness. My hands feel better, and you know what? I don't think I have carpal tunnel syndrome because my hands don't hurt. When something doesn't hurt the way it did before you started, then you'll say, well, this doesn't hurt at all. I can just stay here. But I can't. Because I I gotta get up, I gotta go to work. You don't want to do that, you have to do this, bend your elbows, bend your legs, be mindful that you roll over on the right side and you shrug your shoulders and you come up quietly. You can keep your eyes closed. You have to make sure that maybe you can spin around. Say, my goodness, look at me. I can spin. Then it becomes magic. That you can spin around. And you can look down at your hands and say, my goodness. I don't have to take the weight of my hands. I have to figure out a way that I can get up. If I look at my hands, my mind has to be 
on my tail. Because that has to be soft and I have to be able to shrug my shoulders, go on my fingertips, shrug my shoulders, bend my elbows, lift my bums up, bums up and back, bums up, bums up and back, and I have to come up and do this. Bending from here, and I have to say, wow, hmm, hmm. Come up slowly, track your legs. Don't come up head first. You have to soften. Keep your eyes closed because if you open your eyes, they'll smile. All they did was find out who they were, which was different than anybody else. And that's why we, we don't make a fuss over the people who follow in anything. We make a fuss over the people who find. In other words, wow, that's good. What, what, and it's what Iyengar's about, it's what he does that no one else has ever done before. And it's the same thing when, when, when you look at somebody's sculpture, it shouldn't remind you of anything, because it is what it is. It's not reminiscent of anything. Sometimes you'll see uh, an inspired, quote, an inspired piece where they may have had an experience which then shows up somehow. But for the most part, when you look at a body of work done by anybody, a writer or a composer or a painter or a sculptor or anything like that, it, it, it'll have a character which is unique to that individual. This is a square. So if I take this square this way, and right here I put a rod down, and then 90 degrees I put a rod down here that goes, this one goes over that one, the next one goes over that one until finally, by putting these things this way, all along here, this shape takes place. It builds itself. Does it build itself from the center of the palm? I don't know. I haven't thought of it that way. But anyway, if you take... That's what I think of. As a matter of fact, that notion of efficiency is based on our health. When we go to a doctor because we don't feel right, he goes through all of the gyrations that are necessary to find out if your temperature is close to what it, quote, should be, or if your blood pressure, quote, is close to what it should be. And when it isn't, we're away from the efficient notion of living. Well, you know, it, before the, the forms that I'm dealing with now, before, no one ever dealt with them because there wasn't any way that they, they just simply hadn't thought that way. And then all of a sudden somebody said, What's the shortest distance between two spots, one here and one here? And they said a straight line, right. Okay, now if you have three spots, if you have one here and one here and one here, what's the shortest distance? And the immediate thought is that it's a triangle, but that's not true because the triangle only connects this one, connects this one and this one. So the shortest distance between three points is a center point. A line that goes from here to here, a line that goes from here to here, and a line that goes from... That's so that be, you get a fourth, you get a, what's called a resultant. That was the beginning of minimal thinking. I even had this stuff in my pocket, you see. What do I have to do to get one? <laughs> <laughs> Immortalize something. Yeah, you have one, you have that big one. Trouble wearing it around your neck. <laughs> It wears me. He was so impressed with how Mr. Iyengar demonstrated his knowledge of the self, of the body, the mind, and the spirit. He couldn't believe that somebody could do that. And later, he was so inspired that he said he would commit, he would do a a work in tribute to the masterful use of a person using his person and demonstrating 
this incredible art of yoga, of healing, of doing everything the body was capable of doing. Why you're all laughing? <laughs> Why are you laughing? Your arms or your kids. Show me how wonderful your children are. The arms and the legs. Are you looking for that? 